Welcome to question number 59 of the Summa Theologia as we now are in our last six questions on the topic of the angels, at least in the treatise on the angels. And as I have mentioned before, we are going to go into about 10 questions on creation and then human nature. And then he's going to return to the angels because there's going to be a whole treatise on the governance of the world. And so if you're enjoying learning about the angels, this will not be the end of the angels. Okay, there will be some more uh, in, a, in a little while, in a few weeks. And so uh, this particular question has four articles. So it's a little bit shorter than the last one. It has to do with the will of the the angels. Now, uh, one thing I've really been stressing a lot is that as we talk about a particular topic, I want you to go back and see how it relates to other things that we've already learned about. And when we talk about the will, it's, it's an intellectual appetite as opposed to a sensitive appetite, like you want a, a pizza or you want to take a nap or you have some kind of you know, particular urge that's of a sensitive nature. The, the will is an intellectual appetite, okay? So only intellectual creatures or intellectual beings like God are going to have will. And you might also remember that we had a lot of questions about the will of God and also you know, one of the key things, the key takeaways from this was that uh, only a being that has intellect and have will and only a being that or a creature that has will can have charity or love. All right. They kind of flow together. And so this is going to be a very important thing to remember. And it's going to come up as we go through these four articles here. And the first article says whether there is will in the angels. Now, immediately from what I just said, you should say, well, yes, I know the answer is yes, because they're intellectual creatures. And if you have intellect, you have will. And you can also anticipate what we're going to get to tomorrow, I think, about uh, the love of angels. And yes, if they have will, they have love. Okay, so they always flow together. And so uh, St. Thomas Aquinas here in this article is going to do something very interesting because he's going to kind of talk about that hierarchy of being and how different creatures and even the non-creature God has will or doesn't have will, but has appetite of some sort. So every creature is going to have some kind of appetite. And he says, we must necessarily place a will in the angels. In evidence thereof, it must be borne in mind that since all things flow from the divine will, remember the divine will is the cause of things, okay, and the divine intellect, right? All things in their own way are inclined by appetite towards good, okay? <laughs> Again, God is goodness himself. God is the final cause of all things. God is the purpose for everything that every, every creature does, all right? This fundamentally changes the way we see the world because everything is towards the good, all right? This is really, really important. You got to understand this, right? And so everything we do ultimately is a desire for God. And if once, once that gets into your head, and if you can teach, you know, children this, it needs to be taught in every school in the world because it fundamentally changes the way we see the entire world, but in different ways. Some are inclined to good by their natural inclination without knowledge as plants and inanimate bodies. Okay, so the plants desire good. Okay, you ever, I remember I did a the science fair project one time where a plant will grow towards the sun. Okay, that's because it, that's, it's good. The sun is good. It needs the sun. It needs the water, right? But it doesn't have any kind of reason. Such, inc such inclination towards a good is called a natural appetite. Okay, just a natural appetite. Others, ag again, are inclined toward good, but with some knowledge, not that they know the aspect of goodness, but that they apprehend some particular good as in the sense which knows the sweet, the white, and so on. The inclination which follows this apprehension is called the sensitive appetite. So a dog or a cat or a caterpillar can, Thomas calls it knowledge. I'm almost reluctant to call it knowledge, but it is. He, he, he's, he, he calls it knowledge, so I will. There's certain knowledge of singulars. You know, I want that bone or the cat wants that mouse or the cat, but he's not able to 
understand the concept of it. So a cat doesn't understand mouseness. A dog doesn't understand the, the form of, of boneness. Okay, this is very important. Uh, this is called sensitive appetite, which is interesting though because we have sensitive appetites, but we also have wills, so we have intellectual appetites as well. Other things, again, have an inclination towards good with a knowledge whereby they perceive the aspect of goodness. Okay, where they, they understand the aspect of goodness. Now, that's us, all right, and the angels. This belongs to the intellect. This is most perfectly inclined towards what is good, not indeed as if it were merely guided by another towards some particular good only. Okay, that's to do with teleology, like things devoid of knowledge, nor towards some particular good only as things which have only sensitive knowledge. So he's making a distinction here between all the different creatures. Okay, this is really interesting. But as inclined towards good in general, okay, the intellectual creatures are inclined towards good in general, right? Which, again, final cause, God. That's what he's getting at here. Such inclination is termed will accordingly since the angels by their intellect know the universal aspect of goodness the universal aspect of goodness um, it is manifest that there is will in them okay there was so much packed into that paragraph i wish i you know we, we could probably talk an hour on that we could you know they, they, there's so much there but we, we got to move on right uh, number two article two whether in the angels the will differs from the intellect now, what he's getting at here is that in God, because God is one, God is perfectly simple, the, the, the different things that we identify in God, like will and intellect and power and predestination and you know all these different things, it's all the same in God. It's only different for us. So what he's trying to do here, like he's been trying to do a lot, is say the angels are not God. The angels are different, all right? He says, in the angels, the will is a special faculty or power, which is neither their nature nor their intellect. Okay, he's saying it's not like God. There is not, there is not, that is, <laughs> that it is not their nature is manifest from this, that the nature or essence of a thing is completely comprised within it. Whatever then extends to anything beyond it is, is not its essence. Okay, remember God, it's, it's, it's within God. God may act out, but everything is within God's essence. Everything is one and the same with him due to his simplicity. But the inclination towards something extrinsic uh, comes from something super added to the essence as tendency to a place comes from gravity or lightness, while the inclination to make something like itself comes from the active qualities. Okay, that's a little bit confusing. Um, next paragraph. Now, the will has a natural tendency towards good. Consequently, there, are, there alone are essence. Okay, consequently, there alone are essence and will identified where all good is contained within the essence of him who wills, that is to say, in God, who wills nothing beyond himself except on account of his goodness, right? This cannot be said of any creature because infinite goodness is quite foreign to the nature of any created thing, all right? Remember, one of the qualities of God, one of the attributes of God is infinity. He's the only one that's infinite. He's the only one that's eternal, right? Accordingly, neither the will of the angel nor of any creature can be the same as its essence, okay? The, the intellect and the will is a power that we have and angels have, but it's not our essence. Uh, in like manner, neither can the will be the same thing as the intellect of angel or man, because knowledge comes about insofar as the object known is within the knower. Consequently, the intellect extends itself to what is outside it. Now, this is classic you know, we, we went over this with the, 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 the treatise on the divine, the, the trinity and God's intellect and God's knowledge. And so this keeps coming back is that the object of the intellect is the true and the, the knowledge. When we know something, it becomes part of us. Remember, it's already potentially in us anyways, but we activate it. It becomes a part of us. So there's this intimate relationship between the subject and the object in the act of knowledge. The intellect extends itself to what is outside it according as what in its essence is outside of it disposed to be something 
within it. Okay. On the other hand, the will goes out to what is beyond it, according as by a kind of inclination it tends in a manner to what is outside of it. So in both cases, intellect and will, there's a relationship between the subject and the object, but there's a different because, difference because the will indicates an inclination towards the good that is in the object, whereas with the intellect, it's, it's a knowledge of something that's true, which becomes a part of it, all right? Now, it belongs to one faculty to have within itself something which is outside it, and to another faculty to tend to what is outside it. It almost sounds like the same thing, but he's differentiating intellect and will here. Consequently, intellect and will must necessarily be different powers in every creature. It is not so with God, for he has within himself universal being and the universal good. Therefore, both intellect and will uh, are uh, our will are his nature okay nature equals intellect which equals will which equals being which equals suppositum which equals everything within god okay this is a it's a hard thing for us to get our head around but it is a truth uh, according to saint thomas aquinas all right whether there is free will in the angels some things that are which act not from any previous judgment but as it were moved and made to act by others just as the arrow is directed to the target by the archer. Very, very familiar example that Thomas uses a lot in the Summa is the arrow being pushed towards the target by the archer. Okay, it doesn't have any choice. This would be all the irrational creatures in the world being moved to their end without free will. Others act from some kind of judgment, but not from free will, such as irrational animals for the sheep, flies from the wolf by a kind of judgment whereby it esteems it to be hurtful to itself. Such a judgment is not a free one, but implanted by nature. Isn't that interesting? This changes the entire way you see the world if you realize that all of the actions of our irrational creatures are implanted by nature. But who is the author of that nature? It's God. And so every time you encounter an irrational creature, like a duck or a bird or a fish or a cloud for that matter, you're seeing the work of God. Very few people, it's, this has not been taught in schools. This isn't something that is ever stressed anymore, but fundamentally changes the way you see things. Only an agent endowed with an intellect can act with a judgment, which is free insofar as it apprehends the common note of goodness. Isn't that nice? The common note of goodness from which it can judge this or the other thing to be good. Consequently, wherever there is intellect, there is free will. It is therefore manifest that just as there is intellect, so is there free will in the angels and in a higher degree of perfection than in man. Okay, by the time we get to human nature, you're gonna feel like you've already learned it all because there's so much comparison here between the angels and God and human nature and irrational creatures and you know the 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 plants and in all this it, it's it's beautiful how he's making all the, these comparisons article 4 kind of kind of turns gears here and it's interesting here he says whether there is an irascible and a concupiscible appetite in the angels now this is something that's going to come up in human nature okay and i'll i'll just kind of give you a little hint both the irascible and the concupiscible appetites have to do with passions and i put a <laughs> A, a meal here of wine and pizza because typically, you know, we're drawn to it, okay? And this would be, as we're going to learn, a concupiscible passion where we're drawn to something or we, we flee something that we're afraid of, okay? So it's kind of a fight or flight kind of thing. And what he's going to say here is basically, no, no, the angels don't have irascible and concupiscible passions or appetites but keep these in the back of your mind because they're going to come back up when we get to human nature and it's going to play a very important part of not only human nature but also of virtues because there are going to be virtues that are associated with each of the powers of the soul the intellect and the will and the concupiscible and also the irascible passions okay so i think in some sense thomas aquinas has given us a little preview of a whole lot of things that are going to come up later on in the summa 
that the object of the intellective appetite, otherwise known as the will, is good according to common aspects of goodness, nor can there be any appetite except of what is good. Hence, in the intellective part, the appetite is not divided according to the distinction of some particular good things, as the sensitive appetite is divided, which does not crave for what is good according to the common aspect, but for some particular good object. Accordingly, since there exists in the angels only an intellective appetite, their appetite is not distinguished into a rascible and concupiscible, but remains undivided and is called the will. And so this is, again, the distinction between particulars and universals. Our sensitive appetite is drawn towards this particular wine and this particular pizza and not pizza-ness and wine-ness in general, because that would be the role of the will to look at the overall goodness of something and not some, you know, particular, you know, you don't typically say, oh, I'm craving, you know, pizza-ness. No, you're, you're craving a pizza. You want, you want, a, you want a pizza, not, not the concept of pizza, because nobody can, can satisfy their hunger with the concept of pizza. All right, I hope that all made sense. And uh, this actually was uh, quest question number 59. Okay, so that's a mistake on there. The will of the angels, uh, which is question 59 of the Summa Theologia. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the Summa one question at a time. And uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the love of the angels. And we'll have our final five questions of this treatise on the angels. St. Thomas Aquinas, please pray for us. God bless you.